appreciate the discussion and want to follow up uh, a bit and, and really get some more focus on the, uh, the expected gap. Uh, and, and I understand, uh, Ms. Kiska, that the current gap, now we are talking about a range here, could be as low as we just heard 17 months. I have heard could be up to three years. So could you talk about what NOAA is, what steps NOAA is taking to make sure that the gap stays at the short end of that range? First of all, refocusing the JPSS to a weather-focused mission improves our confidence in meeting both the J-1 and the J-2 launch dates. And as I said, J-1 is on track, J-2 has been accelerated. Close management of the SUMI operations will allow us to preserve that mission for as long as possible. And as I had mentioned, we now have two years of successful operations of SUMI on orbit. The issues that we would have expected to see that are referred to as infant mortality issues, early issues that will manifest themselves and present themselves as problem, have not been seen on SUMI and PP. Um, both of these areas increase development schedule content. Con confidence keeping J-1 on track and SUMI on orbit operations success gives us confidence that if SUMI NPP continues to perform as expected, that we can sig significantly reduce our projected risk of a gap in orbit. Lastly, I will note that the projections that we had had in the past also assumed uh, uh, the, the time associated with calibrating and validating the instruments on J-1. Our experience in SUMI NPP is also indicating that we may be able to re reduce the time associated with the on-orbit checkout and calibration of measurements on the J-1. All of these contribute to um, uh, reduced risk. Thank you. And I, I want to follow up on the SUMI NPP. Uh, Mr. Pounder, in your testimony, you say that the program estimates that there will be a gap of about a year and a half from the time when the current SUMI NPP satellite reaches the end of its expected lifespan and when the JPSS-1 satellite will be in orbit and operational. So the, how, do, how do you calculate the expected lifespan? And could it, obviously it is an expected lifespan, so it could be shorter or longer. And what are you doing to plan for the entire span? So on NPP, that was a demonstration satellite that was not built with the rigor that we will have on JPSS-1. So the expected right. lifespan was three to five years. So the five-year mark, we use that as an, okay, that's, uh, hopefully we get the full five years out of it. And it could go longer, okay? We acknowledge that. But I think it's good to plan for five years. Five years puts you in late 2016. If you launch March 2017 and have a one-year checkout, which is typically how it goes. Now, Mary, I'm glad to hear that hopefully you can reduce that 12-month checkout. Those are the things that we want to see. But that's how we calculate the 17-month likely gap. And that's on the that's best-case scenario on our point. Because what happens is if MPP doesn't last the full five years, it's longer. If JPSS-1 slips, it's longer. So all of those, that is how we get this range of, of uh, likelihood of the gap. But we think planning at least for a 17-month gap is prudent. Thank you. And, Mr. Pounder, I want to ask you another question, too. Uh, in your current report or past reports, I know you have been working on this quite a long time, did you ever identify the NASA Earth Science budget allocation as a cause for delay in satellite procurement at NASA? We have not. And has trouble with climate sensors or a focus on that technology led to a delay in the satellite programs or con contributed at all to the data gaps? Has trouble with the climate sensors? Not particularly. The major issue was with VIRS. The major issue was with VIRS, if you go back historically. And Thank you. And do, have you identified steps that might be taken to prevent a data gap from developing in the GOES program? I know in your testimony you do note that uh, uh, you made multiple recommendations to NOAA. NOAA has taken steps to address the recommendations. Have you identified steps or made recommendations to prevent the data gap, a data gap from developing in the GOES program? So on the GOES situation, it is a little different. It is a, it's a backup, it is a gap. Uh, it is not having an operational backup capability. That is very important because prior to Superstorm Sandy, we repositioned the backup into operations. We did it again this year in 2013. So it is very important to have this operational backup. The issue there is with when um, the current GOES launches, there is likely going to be about a year 
where we don't have the operational uh, backup. So this little slip of a quarter, which could be as long as six months, pushes that to about a year and a half. So there are fairly good contingency plans associated with the GOES program because they actually use them when they actually move satellites into operations. Really what you need to do is minimize any further slips in the launch of GOES so that we don't have a further issue with the backup. Thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wanted Mr. to follow Chairman. up on a, the question that uh, Mr. Maffei asked about goes are. Uh, Ms. Kisa, the cost estimates on JP, JPSS have gone up and down, of course, uh, in recent years at the high point. It was projected to be about $14.6 billion. Now it is down to $11.3 billion. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you folded the key users and stakeholders into the process to ensure that the uh, essential functionality was not sacrificed in the search for savings? Yes, ma'am. As, as we establish our requirements for the JPSS program, we work very closely with all of the major line organizations within NOAA, the Weather Service being obviously the primary line organization, and assure that the requirements trades that we are um, addressing are keeping their highest priority requirements intact. Um, those are referred to as the key performance parameters. So we work very closely with our NOAA counterparts who are taking this data and providing the products and services that the broader country takes advantage of. In addition to that, as we go through these trades, there are multiple opportunities to um, have dialogue with the broader community, and we regularly engage in those, in those forums. Thank you. And, and I know I want to follow up on what Mr. Stewart said earlier about uh, looking forward. And obviously there have been troubles in the past and looking forward. I know that the independent review team completed a report on the JPSS program last year. So what steps have you taken to follow the advice of the, J of the inter independent review team? I think we all need some reassurance that things are getting better. Uh, the independent review team, which was led by Tom Young and a host of other very senior acquisition experts, um, provided a report in July of last year, July of 2012. They had 23 recommendations. This past August, we brought that entire team back and we reviewed with them our response to all of those recommendations. I think it is fair to say that they were pleased, quite pleased with the progress that, that has been made. Um, they have identified a couple of areas that they want additional detail in and we are scheduled to provide that information to them, and they are projecting to have a report available in the November timeframe. Thank you very much. Uh, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.